గుణతిలక సీనియర్ కన్సల్టెంట్ సర్జన్ శ్రీ జయవర్ధన జనరల్ హాస్పిటల్ శ్రీలంక టు టాక్ ఆన్ ద టాపిక్ ద కరెంట్ ఎమర్జెన్సీ అండ్ ట్రామా కేర్ సిచ్యువేషన్ ఇన్ శ్రీలంక once again i must thank iihs for inviting me for this very important conference on trauma which is a very important problem in sri lanka now what a, yesterday i was asked to speak on a, a specific subject called antipersonal minds what i am going to talk today is a general aspects of trauma in sri lanka and this is based on my experience of treating patients trauma victims in our country for 30 years in different parts of sri lanka and what i am going to tell you today is supported by data from various sources uh, for interest sake i have also inter- included a lot of photographs and also some case reports to make this lecture more interesting and also to make to uh, make you understand the people in sri lanka as well as the foreigners who are here the gravity of our pro- the problem of trauma in sri lanka it is a very serious matter but i am sorry to say very little has been done and nothing will be done i cannot do anything about it you cannot do anything about it but and i will tell you at the end of this lecture who can do something about it so we we'll hope that something will be done very soon i have been speaking about trauma in sri lanka at various meetings over these years but sorry to say very little has been done now trauma is a major cause of death and disability throughout the world it is regarded as a neglected killer or the neglected stepchild of modern medicine why do people say that because the money that is spent on trauma prevention trauma control programs is much less than the money that has been spent on other uh, important aspects maybe diabetes heart disease stroke hiv and cancer much more money is spent on those aspects of medicine rather than trauma which is also a, a major killer throughout the world you would have seen some of this data when dr leonard presented this top lecture yesterday it is the leading cause of death in the first four decades in usa deaths amount to 150000 per year the incidence of 1000 per million population and the cost is enormous you can see the cost now in sri lanka we do not have data like that and that is the biggest problem we face in sri lanka but we know that in sri lanka the leading cause of hospital admission since 1995 is trauma and that the war would have contributed some aspects to that but even today the leading cause of hospital admissions in sri lanka is trauma and if you look at the hospital deaths the rank number is 11 so these are different aspects of trauma that i am going to talk to you about in this country you can see i showed you some pictures of mine injuries we have stab injuries people falling from trains and buses anti personal mine injuries then there are children or patients goat by animals then the problem of burns kerosene oil bottle lamps still even today we see that in sri lanka so i will try to highlight these aspects with some photographs and case reports of patients that i have treated in the hospital that i worked so in this lecture i will touch upon these aspects the incidence and causes of trauma the impact of trauma on society the trauma care services in our country and my recommendations for control and improved care because i consider this a serious problem now the first thing that you encounter when you want to study trauma in sri lanka is this 
we don't have a central data collection unit. And therefore, if anyone wants to study trauma, you have to go, go around various sources. And the figures we cannot be, we do not know whether these figures are reliable. So what are the sources? We can go to the annual health bulletin of the Ministry of Health, but the, last, the latest one that has been published is 2008. Then we go to the police department. If you know someone in the police department, they will give you the data. Otherwise, they will say, please, don't come and worry us. Then we go to the Department of Census and Statistics. Once again, you have to know someone there. Epidemiology unit, medical statisticians. We can gather data from hospitals and accident services. And if we look at this data, we will know that it has significant morbidity and mortality. So now, let me show you some of the data. You can see 1991, the rank was number three. The latest bulletin we have is 2008. According to that, the rank is one, the number one cause. Number of admissions, over half a million. And it amounts to 15.6 of hospital admissions. Total number of hospital admissions amount to more than 4 million. So you can see more than half a million admissions are to hospitals in Sri Lanka due to trauma. And all these patients are getting free treatment. Whatever hospital they go, they get free treatment whether it's a victim of road traffic accident, stab injury, assault, everyone is getting free treatment. Now, what are the causes of trauma in our country? We have road traffic accidents, occupational accidents, burns, usually kerosene oil bottle lamps, or maybe LP gas burns. We had burns caused by bomb explosions and other explosive devices during the war. Then we had war injuries, but at the moment we don't have a war but we have isolated cases of gunshot injury almost every day. Then there are home accidents which occur in every home due to negligence, due to accidents. Then assaults and stab injuries. These are very common during the New Year season, April and December. And most of them are after, under the influence of liquor, especially the special brew in the village called Kasipu. Now, road traffic accidents, this is not a problem confined to Sri Lanka. It is a universal problem. Road traffic accidents occur all over the world. But we have not taken enough precautions to prevent this problem in our country. Road traffic accidents, the cost in billions. You can see the amount of money the government of Sri Lanka has to spend for victims of road traffic accidents. Road traffic accidents, the latest figure that I have got is 2012. The total number of accidents, you can see the numbers going up. 2010, 37,000. 2012, gone up to 42,000. There's an increase in the number of road traffic accidents in Sri Lanka. The number of fatal accidents have increased and the number of deaths have increased. In Sri Lanka, six people are dying on our roads every day. Six people are dying on our roads every day. Injured, the number of injured people, you can see that toss has gone up. In 2002, there were only 18,000. In 2012, it has gone up to 30,000 or more. And most of them, you can see the young group, 21 to 55 years, more than 65% of these victims are in that young age group. Six people are dying on our roads every day, and there are 135 accidents per day. What are the vehicles involved? The motorcycle is the commonest vehicle involved in accidents. The trishaw, you can see how they ride, go on this trishaw. The three-wheeler or the bajaj, though people who have come from overseas, please don't get onto this trishaw. You may not be able to go back home. <laughs> the trishaw is very dangerous because it has only three wheels and these people do not respect the highway code. Then the motor car, private bus and van. Even private buses are very dangerous. Then who are the victims? The dead victims are pedestrians. The commonest victim who dies on the road is the pedestrian. Because the pedestrian doesn't, doesn't walk on the pavement. 
He's walking on the main road. You can see that even near the hospital. And they don't use the pedestrian crossing. Sometimes the vehicle doesn't stop at the pedestrian crossing. Payments sometimes are occupied by other people. So the pedestrian is the one who has to suffer the injury. Motorcyclists, passengers in vehicles, cyclists and the driver. This is the order of victims. Now I want to show you a very interesting case of a, to show you the morbidity that is associated with road traffic accidents. This young man was a trishaw driver. One day after his work, he finished work at about 10 o'clock in the evening and he was going home and he met with an accident. Naturally, working the whole day, he would have been sleepy and he went and knocked on a vehicle in front. The, the trishaw crashed, the entire windscreen was shattered and glass piece cut his neck right up to the cervical spine. Right up to the cervical spine means all the important structures in the neck were cut. The skin, the trachea, thyroid gland, both recurrent laryngeal nerves, esophagus, everything was cut except the internal jugular and the carotid artery. All the other structures were cut. So this is a very serious injury. He was brought to hospital. There what happened? He had a tracheostomy and also a primary suture of the esophagus. This is the trishaw. So he had a tracheostomy and a primary end-to-end -end suture of the esophagus to restore the continuity of the esophagus so that he can take his food and drink in the future. But we know when you suture the esophagus together, you will end up with a stricture because the esophagus, unlike the stomach, small bubble or the large bubble, cannot be mobilized to get adequate length. And also there is problem of the blood supply of the esophagus. So what happened? He developed a stricture and he could not swallow any food. So they did a jejunostomy. A jejunostomy means a tube was inserted to his small bubble so that he can be fed but only liquids. So this young man of 25 years has a tracheostomy and he has another tube called jejunostomy to feed him. He cannot speak because of tracheostomy. He has lost his voice. And th those hospital authorities told him, young man, we cannot do anything more for you. You go home. And he was given another tracheostomy tube. He was trained to change this tracheostomy tube and he was also asked to buy a mirror, a, a funnel, and a jug. So he bought all that, he went home, and every morning he used to change this tracheostomy tube by looking at this mirror. He washed the tracheostomy tube, replaced with a new tube or the other tube, washed it nicely, and changed. He cannot speak, he cannot eat, he cannot drink. He's feeding through this tube. But how can this man? 25 year old man go on living like this for so many years. Suddenly he came to a hospital and he came to my ward and I thought something must be done for this man so that he must get back to his occupation. He cannot be a doctor but he can be a trishaw driver once again. So you can see this man changing his tracheostomy tube in my consultation room. And this is how he was feeding a jug and a funnel and the fluid going through this tube into his jejunum. That was the only way he could take his nutrition. Then we did a, a contrast study of his uh, esophagus. A barium solo was done and you can see a stricture. A stricture in the upper part of the esophagus or the cervical esophagus. A narrow part which prevents the food and the drink or the fluid going down which caused the dysphagia. So I thought something has to be done. Once, the, once you get a stricture in the esophagus or a narrowing of the esophagus, that esophagus is useless. It must be removed and put in the dustbin. And then we must construct a new esophagus. And that can be done using the stomach or the large bubble. So this is the stomach, which has been now mobilized and taken out of the stomach, abdomen, and now it has to be taken through the chest into the neck and connected to the normal part of the esophagus to restore continuity of his alimentary tract or the digestive tract 
so that he'll be able to eat and drink in the normal manner once again. So we did that operation, the stomach was mobilized from the abdomen, taken up through the chest, brought to the neck, connected to the cervical esophagus, and he was able to eat and drink. You can see the tube has now been removed. He doesn't need the funnel and the jug, but he still has a tracheostomy tube. And then I referred this patient to our ENT surgeon who did something in his larynx, and he was able to remove that. Esophagus, uh, the tracheostomy tube as well, his voice returned, but not normal, but he had some voice. We had removed his tubes. He was able to take food and drink in the normal manner, and now he has gone back. He took a loan and bought another treasure. This, I'm showing you, to see the gravity of the problem these people undergo because of accidents. It is serious morbidity, and this man could have died if that glass cut his main carotid artery or the internal jugular. Now what is interesting is the day he went and bought this trishaw, he came driving this new trishaw to my hospital and he wanted me to be his first passenger. So that was a very great day for me. For me it was a pleasure going in this trishaw. It was, gives me greater pleasure than going in a Lamborghini. So this is just an illustration to show the gravity of the problem, the morbidity, and also the enjoyment that we can have when we see these people getting back to their occupation. Occupational accidents is another problem in our country. As you know, Sri Lanka, 37% of our people are employed in agriculture, in, not in the urban areas, in rural areas most of them in paddy cultivation and other types of cultivation. Then there are also industrial accidents. Agricultural accidents, there are many types that we encounter, mostly in rural areas, and these are some accidents that I witnessed when I was working in outstation hospitals. So there are accidents, I'm sure most of you would not have seen these problems, because you don't see this in Colombo. We have trap gun injuries. Then there are injuries caused by animals, both wild animals and domestic animals. Injuries caused by various types of machinery. People sustain injury following falls. What are these trap guns? Trap guns are guns used by the chain cultivators in cultivating in remote villages to, to protect their crops from wild animals, especially the wild boar and the deer. This is a trap gun that is manufactured by these farmers consisting of a metal tube which is packed with explosive devices. One end is closed, the other end is open, and you can see the trigger mechanism. The level of that cord depends on which animal they expect to come there, maybe wild boar or deer. Now, anyone, another fellow farmer passing that and tripping over this cord will cause explosion of this gun, and the patient gets injured. And usually the injuries are below knee. Sometimes it affects other areas of the body. This is a farmer setting a trap gun. And sometimes the, the trap gun explodes in the person's hand, causing serious problem, you can see. So this is disability. It is permanent disability. Why do they use trap guns? Because they are not given other guns or shotguns to protect their crops from these wild animals. So they have to depend on trap guns. Trap guns are illegal, but no one has been charged for this today. So they have to use these trap guns, and sometimes it explodes in their hand, and this is what happens. He will end up in an amputation. He's disabled for life. This farmer cannot work in the paddy field anymore, and he's, he will have to depend on the state for the rest of his life. Trap guns, I said, usually cause damage in the region of the knee joint or below. Here is a, a trap gun injury at the level of the knee joint. Multiple pellets have gone through his knee, and some of them are embedded inside the joint. So he is again disabled. And this is a bad compound fracture. You can see small metal fragments. The bone is shattered. 
he might end up in amputation because in addition to the bone injury, there is soft tissue injury, damage to blood vessels and nerves. So some of them end up in amputation. Then there are injuries caused by animals. This is a bear, you can see. Some of these people cultivate in, in the jungle areas and the bear, they, if you see a bear, please don't disturb the bear because the bear will jump on your face and take your scalp away. Although the bear does not eat the scalp, he's a vegetarian. But he causes serious damage, you can see. Almost these scalping injuries, facial injuries, fracture mandible, fracture nose, so complete disfigurement of the face. And this is, these are the problems. Elephants. Today there's a big problem with elephants. What is called the human elephant conflict. The human is attacking the elephant and the elephant is attacking the human. That is called the human elephant conflict in Sri Lanka. This elephant attacked this man. You can see the whole face, neck, upper part of the body, chest swollen because it ruptured the trachea. And air escaped out causing what is called surgical emphysema. Air in the subcutaneous tissue. That difficulty in breathing. So the treatment is very simple but must be done as soon as possible, it's tracheostomy. You do a tracheostomy and the patient will recover. Here is the patient after recovery. Then we have other wild animals. This is another story I want to tell you. A attack, this child was attacked by a wild buffalo in a remote part close to Batiklo. This child was brought to hospital when I was working at Polon Narua. Got injured. In late in the evening and all the viscera came out, what is called evisceration. There was no first aid, no paramedics, no ambulance, nothing. And the father of this patient had to find a van to transport this child to Batiklo, uh, from Batiklo or Valachena to Polonnaru Hospital, which took another four hours. And the child was transported on the floorboard of this van without drips, without first aid, without anything. And on admission, the child was in a collapsed condition with multiple perforations of his bubble. And everything has come out, the small bubble, and in a state of shock. <coughs> so these patients need immediate attention. We cannot transfer them to another hospital. They'll die on the way. So these are things we have to attend immediately, resuscitate the patient, take to theater, do a laparotomy, repair the bubble perforations, and child will recover, but must be done as soon as possible. This is another machine, I'm sure people living in the outstation areas would have seen this machine. This is called the winnowing fan, which is used to winnow the paddy grain. During harvest time, you, you can see these machines being used commonly in paddy fields. You can see a, a fan without any protection, no protective cover. There are two fan belts which are also open. Now, people using this machine, getting too close to this machine, what will happen? They will get injured by this fan blade or by this uh, the, the fan blade or by these belts. This is what they do, what is called winnowing of the pedigree, that is cleaning of the pedigree by, by the blowing or the wind caused by this rotation of this fan. But it's very dangerous. So what has happened? Multiple amputation of the fingers. Then the other problem I want to talk to you briefly is burns. Kerosene oil bottle lamps are still being used in our country. Then there are others who sustain electrical burns. LP gas burns used in our, for cooking purposes. Bomb explosions, burns due to bomb explosions we saw in the past. Then there are others who sustain injury from corrosive acids, either by swallowing these acids or people throw acids onto other people. And this is the kerosene oil bottle lamp which is used by the people who do not have electricity in their homes. This is the source of light for the poor, peel, poor, poor people of Sri Lanka. You have kerosene oil inside, the bottle topples, the kerosene oil leaks out, 
and the entire area catches fire and the people around also will get burnt because their clothing will catch fire. So the amount of victims we have, over 13,000 victims, 220 deaths, the cost of managing these burns, over 2 million per year. And we have burns units only in very few selected teaching hospitals, one in Colombo, one in Candy, and maybe one in Gaul. So most of these other patients with burns are treated in general surgical wards. Here is a victim of a kerosene oil bottle lamp. You can see the extent of burns. And these actually need specialized care in burns units. But because we do not have specialized burn unit adequate number in our country, these most of them are treated in general surgical wards. Here is another child you can see burned. Sitting on that bed covered by a mosquito net and treated by the open technique of applying silver sulfur diazine and leaving it open without any dressing. This is the child you can see burns have healed. Luckily these are not deep burns, they are superficial burns. In two weeks the scab will come out and there will be regeneration of the skin. This is a man who has taken corrosive. Corrosive acids have been taken with the idea of committing suicide. But he did not die. Then what happens? He becomes a problem for the surgeon. Because he has taken corrosives, his esophagus has got narrow. The stricture of the esophagus has developed. He cannot take any food or drink. He is malnourished, he is emaciated, dehydrated, anemic. So first of all, before we operate, we have to do a jejunostomy or a gastrostomy, feed him for three to six months, improve his nutrition, and then plan surgery to, to, to give him a new esophagus. These are burns I showed you yesterday by bomb, from bomb explosions, which also needs active resuscitation because they need a lot of fluid. This is what happens if burns are not treated properly. Keloid formation, contractures, scars, disfigurement. Now the other problem of treating burns in Sri Lanka is that some of them do not come to hospital. Some come to hospital, after some time they go and take native treatment and they get this disfigurement due to contractures. Here is another child who went for native treatment, got a contracture, unable to raise the arm because of a contracture in the axilla. So need plastic surgery, we have to remove that contracture and skin graft. So these are all problems faced because they do not have best care at the primary time of injury. Another patient with burns, High mortality, almost 90% burns. So with the idea of preventing these burns, a surgeon in Sri Lanka, one Dr. Godogumbra, recommended this safe bottle lamp. It is like a small marmite bottle with a heavy bottom and a screw cap so that even if it topples, the kerosene oil does not leak out and that area is safe. So these have been distributed to people who are using the bottle lamps in Sri Lanka and that has reduced the amount of injury or burns in remote villages. Home accidents that can occur at in, in any home, especially children, they play with different objects. This child was playing with a wooden spike, he fell and the spike went through the chest and was brought to hospital acutely dysnic. Face is swollen, neck is swollen, chest is swollen acute pneumothorax and surgical emphysema. Now these must be recognized as soon as possible. I will tell you later on where they are treated in this country because we do not have accident services or emergency departments they are brought direct to the surgical ward. So some, someone there must attend to this type of patient as soon as possible and they will recover provided you give the best treatment insertion of an intercostal tube or a chest drain and they will recover. Step injuries, I told you, very common. You can see a step injury, you can see a stain on that knife. This, this knife was inside this man's head. 
stabbed by the own brother. He could not pull it out again. So he referred this patient to the surgeon to pull it out. But before I pulled it out, I took a photograph. This is another patient who lost her eye after being cut on the eye. Lost the eye. Boy injuries, I am not going to talk to you on boy injuries because I think I spoke to you about this yesterday. This is the Johnny mine. You can have a better view of this Johnny mine today. You can see the small box with the lid, the wire, two pen torch batteries, detonator, 25 grams of explosive. And that is the damage. And these are affecting civilians unless demining has been done completely. Now, this is another aspect I want to tell you about facilities for trauma care and pre-hospital care in our country. Now, we know management of trauma is a coordinated effort from the time of injury, hospital, that is pre-hospital care, hospital care, and management rehabilitation afterwards. This system is not well developed in Sri Lanka. These are the things, first of all, we must notify that there has been an accident. There must be a system of good communication. There must be response and treatment and emergency facility. So these are the key elements for emergency medical care, which are used in most other developed Western countries. But this system is very primitive in Sri Lanka. The Americans who are here will be familiar with this number, 911. If you have injury or accident or any emergency in America, you dial 911. And the ambulance station will receive this call and dispatch the ambulance to the victim. And they will also communicate with the hospital. They might communicate with the fire brigade or the police. And then attend to this casualty. The casualty is brought to hospital. The doctors in the emergency department are kept informed and they are ready to treat this emergency. Sometimes large number of casualties come at the same time. Now in Sri Lanka, what happened to these patients? In Sri Lanka, we have what are called teaching hospitals, provincial hospitals and base hospitals. We do not have trauma centers, except the one on the other side of this building, the accident service, and a few Units like that in Gaul, Colombo South, Gaul, uh, Candy. But they are not developed to this extent as the accident service in Colombo. The trauma center in Colombo, which is very well developed with all the facilities, all the expertise is there, which is not available in the accident services or the trauma centers in other parts of the country. So what happens to the trauma victim? They go direct to the surgical ward, or what is called casualty ward. And the first person to see the patient will be the house officer. The house officer or the medical officer in the ward will be the first person to see the casualty. There is no notice of a casualty coming. Some of them are not coming in ambulances. They come in whatever vehicle that is available. It may be a bus, it may be a truck, it may be a um, tractor or it may be a trishaw. So you can see there can be damage during transport of these patients. And majority of these, we do not have the multidisciplinary approach that a trauma victim should have. And we also have another problem in Sri Lanka. You can see a victim, a fracture victim, patient with a fractured femur being treated like this. These are not treatment in hospital. These are treatment by various types of what are called osteopaths in Sri Lanka. That is another problem because sometimes they come to hospital for a few few days, we put a plaster, they leave the hospital, they go to that osteopath, he removes the plaster. If I ask anyone in this audience what this is, I don't think they will know. This is, you know, that osteopath visited the uh, an orthopedic ward one day and he saw patients being treated on traction. They saw, he saw 
a weight being hung and the foot end of the bed, foot end of the bed elevated, head down. That is called traction for treatment of lower limb injuries. So he went back to his to his uh, medical facility, and he said, "I will also do fracture treatment by traction." And he got hold of a big stone and tied that stone to his leg, but there is no traction. This boy had a fracture femur, and he can rotate round this stone. He can rotate. Anyway, I, uh, I had the chance to visit this osteopath and take these pictures for the audience today. I did not tell him that I am a surgeon. I told him I am a journalist, and I am going to give you a lot of publicity by showing these pictures. So he allowed me in. So this is the accident service in our hospital, one of the best and. Anyone working in this trauma center will get a very good experience in managing all types of trauma that you can see. Now, some figures from accident service. You can see the number of patients who are treated. Over 105,000 patients treated. Admissions, 66,000. Transfers from other hospitals, deaths nearly 200. Burns, 714 patients with burns. Admitted to accident service in 2012, and most of the victims are road traffic accident victims. There are occupational accidents, home accidents, assaults. What I showed you. So there is a mixture of patients coming to this accident service with different types of problems, and it is the best place for anyone to learn trauma. So now, what can be? I, I have shown you the gravity of this problem in Sri Lanka. What can be done? First thing is, I think, first matter is that we must recognize trauma as a disease. If you do not recognize trauma as a disease, we cannot have any plans to counter this problem. I told you this is the commonest cause of admissions to our hospitals, more than any other problem. More than half a million admissions to our hospitals. Therefore, we must recognize trauma as a non-communicable disease. Now. In Sri Lanka, we have so many programs to control diseases. We have what is called malaria control program. Another con program to control filaria, rabies, sexually transmitted diseases. We have leprosy control programs like that. You know, cancer control program, anti chest problems. We have many programs like this, and these programs were initiated to control diseases. And I can tell you, malaria has been completely eradicated because of this program. So we must first of all recognize trauma as a disease, and therefore, this is the weapon that we must use—the weapon of epidemiology. And there is a big role for health administrators and planners in countering this problem. So we must start a trauma control program in our country. We need a trauma control program which will look into all aspects of trauma. So, I told you first of all, we do not have good statistics. To have any control program, we need to have very good database. We must know the types of trauma in different parts of our country. So, we have to gather data. Initially, we have to gather data, and this is very simple because. In our hospitals, there is a system of gathering data from communicable diseases. If a patient with dengue fever goes to hospital today, there is data collected and sent to the Colombo head office. So we have trauma victim going to hospital, notification goes to the medical office of health. From there, it goes to the regional director, trauma control program, and the director general of health services in charge of this program. And this trauma control program will then guide. In the prevention of trauma, pre-hospital care, hospital care, rehabilitation. Another same way, you can see the trauma control program doing all aspects of trauma. But first of all, we need a national policy. We can monitor the control program. We need rehabilitation. They can monitor hospital care and services. There must be a good communication network, which is not difficult today with so many methods of communication. 
they must have an ambulance service. We must train paramedics. We must teach children in school first aid. That should begin at school level. There must be adequate legislation. We should not only have legislation, but we must also implement the legislation. Then we must have trauma prevention programs. Technical guidance must be there. So these are aspects which a trauma control program can coordinate. Otherwise, there is no way of doing this. And we also know that prevention is better than cure. And that is another aspect which has to be um, initiated in Sri Lanka because most of the accidents I showed you, trap gun injuries, winnowing fan injuries, most of them are preventable. But does anyone take any notice or educate the public on how, what should be done? Burns, another aspect. Now this, I will show you one important aspect, another case report, just to show the value of prevention. Now this is another winnowing fan, a fan used by a farmer. It is carried from one paddy field to another on his cycle, connected to a small motor. And this is his occupation. Take this fan from one paddy field to another during the harvest season and then we know the paddy grain. And metal like our bones undergo fatigue fracture. You can see one blade has had a fatigue fracture and has been welded. There's a welding or plaster has been put like creating fracture. One blade has been welded that blade that came out has been welded. Now where is this other blade? You can see another aspect, another part of this blade is missing. Where is it? And this is, I am showing this just for the sake of showing that we can prevent diseases. If only that fan or the that fan had a cover, a protective cover, this injury would not have occurred. These are things which people should know in our country. That is why I am showing this. This is a preventable accident. Now when a patient like this comes to the hospital, every, yes, from yesterday, today we heard about A, B, C, D, E of trauma. Now when a patient like this comes to hospital, what, what do you do? We don't start with A. We forget A. I forgot A for the moment. I forgot B. And I, I didn't forget C. But C does not mean circulation. C means camera. So I went direct to my camera. Without circulation. Circulation was all right. He was living. So I went for my camera, took a good picture, which I am able to show today. And I have shown this picture not only in Sri Lanka, but in many parts of the world. And people are so upset when they see this. In one lecture, one person fainted in the audience. So these are preventable injuries. So remember to take your camera when you are treating trauma. So you can see how much it has gone in. It went in through the face just near the eye between the eye and the nose, cutting into the frontal fossa. But this man, is he living or dead? This is after operation. What is his occupation? Now, he is doing the same job. I tried to persuade him not to use that fan, but that is the only way he can live. So he has gone back to this machine, but he has not come to me again. This I told you, first aid, a very important and neglected field. We must start treat, treat, telling students in schools, first aid, how to stop bleeding. This soldier died in war because there was no one to stop bleeding from the small injury on the thigh. Here you can see trap gun injury I showed you completely disabled because of this a preventable accident. So, my dear friends, trauma is a big problem in Sri Lanka and we have to do a lot of things to counter this major problem in, the, in our country. So, we need health education. 
we need preventive programs. We have to help these victims who are disabled for life. We have to teach first aid. We must train paramedics, not only in Colombo but throughout the country. We need ambulance services with facilities to transfer patients to trauma services. And finally, we need rehabilitation of these victims who suffer the consequences of trauma. And for all that I told you, I cannot do anything, you cannot do anything. Combined, both of us cannot do anything. But we need a political will to change the system in our country. And this can be done only at the highest level, where there should be a national policy for trauma control. Without that, any of us trying will not succeed. I have tried many years. I have been opposed, but nothing has happened. So this is the only solution. But I hope those people there at the top will realize the importance of this problem in our country. Because a lot of money is wasted by trying to treat these patients. It can be prevented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that interesting presentation. I would like to invite Dr. Nihal De Silva to the stage. Dr. Gunatilaka, dear sir. Thank you very much for coming these two days and sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. We really appreciate your contribution to BioInquirer 2014. Please accept a token of appreciation from my 